the historic preservation lectures and seminars. In case you missed the last two, the first one was two weeks ago. It was on uh, preservation of historic photos and papers and documents. Uh, and the one last week was on painting historic houses. If you missed both of those, uh, Mr. Travers here has videotaped them and uh, probably two ways you can actually see that. One is to purchase the video and hopefully it'll be on uh, our local access channel sometime in the future also, so keep an eye out for that, uh, as well as this one. A couple of other items, uh, if you have to go to the bathroom, obviously it's outside and around the corner and there's also one upstairs. I wanted to point out a couple of other projects that the Historic Preservation Commission has been working on. Uh, you see uh, lined up along the uh, uh, wall here, a series of photographs. Uh, we received a grant from the uh, Lynn County Historic Preservation Group uh, to do a historic photo display. We have about uh, six or seven hundred uh, old glass negatives in our archives, and we picked the best of all those negatives uh, and grouped them in a series of themes, depicting different li uh, life as it existed uh, at the turn of the century. And we have a series of photographs there's about 10 photographs plus a, a large centerpiece and a description. Those will be on display in a rotating basis in the uh, Mount Vernon uh, Visitor Center and then also they're for loan around to other groups including the schools and other people who might have use for them. So that's a project I wanted to point out. Uh, this fall we're hopefully working on a, a porch seminar lecture. Uh, if I can't find somebody to put it together, I'll put it together myself and I've already got got that started. So that's something to look forward to this fall. Uh, without any further delay, I want to get started in today's program. Uh, most of you know Dick Thomas. He's the past chair of this Historic Preservation Commission, but his uh, accolades go far beyond that. Uh, I don't think anyone can approach uh, his knowledge of Mount Vernon's uh, architectural history for sure, and probably its history in general. And I'm looking forward to this as one opportunity we can get some of it now on videotape. And <laughs> get some of his knowledge out and about where other people can use it. So without any more delay, I'll let uh, <coughs> Thomas take over. Okay. Well, it's always fun to talk about uh, my hometown. I've lived here long enough to at least claim it as a hometown. Although when you live in Mount Vernon, you'd realize that um, you're never really a full Mount Vernonite unless you were born and raised here. It's a wonderful story of... Um, uh, one of our, the former um, owner of the Bauman's clothing store who moved here when he was nine months old and all of his colleagues never let him forget that. The, the day he died, Frank uh, Young was, uh, was considered by the old timers as just uh, you know, a newcomer into the community. So I, I say that with some intrepidation, but um, it is fun to talk about one's own hometown, especially when it's as interesting uh, and as charming as Mount Vernon. When I came to town uh, many years ago, I uh, wondered to myself, what is it that makes Mount Vernon different from other Iowa small towns? And I think through the years, uh, I've discovered a number of things that really make us quite different. And I've spent a lot of time looking at other small towns in eastern Iowa. For one thing, Mount Vernon is a pre-railroad town. It was here before the railroads, and we'll talk about that. And we were very fortunate and blessed that the railroad chose to come by here. Uh, because it didn't go by a lot of small towns that had been founded before 18, the 1850s, and those towns died or disappeared. And the classic case in this area is Ely, which was another pre-railroad town, but didn't get a railroad. And Cedar Rapids almost didn't make it. Uh, they had to get together with uh, a group of businessmen and put up the capital to build a spur line into, Mount, into Cedar Rapids. The railroad, uh, the first great transcontinental railroad, which was the old Northwestern, uh, this does not go through Cedar Rapids. It goes south of town. Uh, they had to build a spur line up into town in order to, to have a railroad. So it's it. we are unique in that we are a pre-railroad town. Most western towns in Iowa are all built along the railroads and were built by the railroads uh, at, as well. The second thing that really makes this town unusual is its topography. That is, it's the hill. And the hill is going to play a very important role in shaping uh, the, uh, how this community develops. I think a third factor, a little more intangible though, is the fact that this town seems to have had a long history of economic stability. We have not been subject to boom and bust. There's never been a, a huge building boom or a complete collapse. 
the stability of the community is really quite remarkable. Uh, part of that, of course, is due to the single industry in the town, the college, which uh, has, has survived uh, since 1853. Now, if we put all those factors together, the free railroad, the hill, economic stability, uh, we have a kind of microcosm, I think, of a great American phenomena, and that is the phenomena of, the, of college building across the West. The denominations, particularly Methodist, Presbyterians, United Church of Christ, built hundreds of colleges across this country as they moved uh, across, particularly from the Ohio River, uh, all the way to the West Coast. Uh, and uh, many of these colleges were put in small towns. Some of the towns grew, and they were small when the colleges were put there, but many of these colleges didn't survive. Uh, and this college uh, did survive, and the interrelationship, the interaction, between the college and the town is very evident in our architectural heritage as well as, as our larger uh, history. And it is that note that got the National, interest, the National Register of Historic Places interested in uh, the large numbers of properties that were here that reflect that history. The first district, uh, the Cornell District, uh, Cornell Mount Vernon District, clearly tries to show the interaction of a small town and a small college and how this interdependence uh, shapes both, uh, both institutions and both institutions together uh, make up a whole which is larger than its parts. So today I'm going to quickly try to introduce you to some of the main themes of uh, the history of our town and to look at some of the architectural heritage uh, that is here. I'm going to totally neglect the business district uh, we may want to do that at another time. Uh, I want to try to concentrate primarily on domestic architecture. Uh, I've also um, not paid much attention to the college, which is such an important part of the town. But it has a history uh, in and of itself, as well as the history uh, that is related to the community. Uh, we have, as we have uh, tried to develop uh, the architectural historical materials for this town, settled on a historical timeline that is on the wall and is part of this uh, permanent display here uh, in City Hall. Uh, we talk about the military road era, the era, early era before the railroad, then the railroad itself, uh, the railroad era, uh, and then we go to the Lincoln Highway era uh, as major themes for uh, organizing the history of the community. And I will be referring to that, but today I want to uh, try a slightly different kind of scheme uh, for uh, looking at our, uh, our timeline and our history. Now, I'd like to start with the period from 1832 through 1846. And of course, 1846 is Iowa statehood. So in, we're talking about the initial settlement period of the state through uh, its settlement, through territory, uh, up through uh, statehood in 1856. And we need to remember when Iowa became a state, there were still vast areas of the state that were uninhabited, uh, particularly in the west. The west will, uh, western Iowa, particularly northwestern Iowa, uh, will not be settled till after the Civil War in any, uh, with any serious population density. Well, the land that Mount Vernon is in was probably part of the Black Hawk uh, Purchase of 1832. Black Hawk and his band uh, got into trouble with the United States government. Uh, there was a summer war in uh, Illinois along the uh, Rock River, uh, and as a penalty for causing that war, war damages, reparations, whatever you want to call it, the Sac and Fox uh, were required to give up a strip of land about 180 miles long, which is uh, and 50 miles wide, uh, and that 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 line follows the uh, Mississippi River. So there's a point, as you know, um, we are about 50 miles from, the, the, from Clinton, at least at that point, and the river takes this huge bend. Now, the question that uh, we have yet to answer is whether or not Mount Vernon is in this first uh, land session. Now, one of the uh, lores uh, and stories uh, has to do with um, Standing Rock. Anybody know where Standing Rock is? Seen Standing Rock? Well, it's about a mile and three quarters south of town. 
and it's a huge boulder, stands out in the field, and from that boulder you can easily see the river. And one of the stories is that stone marked for settlers marked the edge of the Black Hawk Purchase. Now, if that is the case, and, and if you read the treaties and look at the maps, it probably is. It's, it's probably got some truth to this myth. Uh, but whether or not the town is actually in the Black Hawk Land Purchase it doesn't depend on where that rock is as much as where the other two points of this huge triangle are. Now, what's the angle from the rock over? Uh, and I'm convinced that probably part of our town was in the purchase and probably part of it was not. Depends on how those angles run. You move one point, uh, three quarters of a mile, and we're out of it. Uh, you move it the other way, and we're really in it. So uh, I can't really tell you. But we are, uh, we are clearly on the edge of the first land session, the first area open to white settlement. Now, the settlers who came into this area came up, most of them came up um, the Mississippi River after a journey from along the Ohio River down to the uh, Mississippi and then back up the Mississippi through St. Louis and on up to Burlington and Muscatine. Then they followed the river systems uh, of eastern Iowa, uh, the Cedar, uh, the Wapsipinicon, the Iowa, they followed those rivers. So the rivers were the highways of the early settlers. And in this area, the town that was founded earliest is Ivanhoe, a little spot on the river. Uh, and it, uh, it has a very early founding date. The only real authentic remains of uh, Ivanhoe is probably the Wolf Cemetery, small cemetery, private cemetery sitting out in the middle of the, the plain. Of, of the fields, uh, but it does have graves from early, very early settlers who thought Ivanhoe would really be, the tr would really be uh, a significant town. Now most of the, of the settlers who came along the river also discovered well-worn Indian trails. And most of the early roads in Lynn County are probably uh, Indian trails. Uh, we know that uh, from very early uh, early man in this area uh, knew about the Palisades and the caves at the Palisades. Uh, through the years, the archaeologists have found some significant uh, artifacts that document the presence of um, what we would say pre-Indians uh, along the, the Palisades, probably following the river, hunting and fishing, gathering uh, in the, the abundance of the river. So going along the river, following the rivers, either by canoe or boat or just simply using the river as a marker and walking alongside of it uh, was the, the way people came into the area. There was a trail uh, rather soon across the, the great uh, uh, Illinois prairies from Chicago, which wasn't much but an Indian fort uh, in these days, um, across Illinois and then across the river um, to this area. But most of the settlers came up to uh, up through the Mississippi. Now, uh, at the same time, the closest town, the Mount Vernon's closest town to the Mississippi River is Muscatine. Most people think about, well, it's got to be Clinton because that's the way the roads go. No, the closest town to the Mississippi from Mount Vernon is Muscatine. And if you got off the boat in Muscatine and walked across the prairies to Moscow, you picked up the Cedar River. And that's not much of a trip. But early, uh, some early adventurers, financial adventurers in this area, built a log road from Muscatine to Tipton. Uh, and we're going to see all this on the map here, if I can join you here. Um, this is an 1851 map of Iowa. Uh, Mount Vernon is going to be uh, in here. And if you'll notice, uh, there's Muscatine, and they've got a nice big double line road here, which is Muscatine to Tipton, the Log Road, or the Cord Road. But that's the closest town to, to Mount Vernon. So when the road is built by the 1840s, uh, settlers come up to Muscatine, take the Cord Road to Tipton, and then cross country any place into eastern Iowa. Um, otherwise, as I say, you can get off at Muscatine, and uh, Moscow is, where did you go, Moscow? Yeah, Moscow's just halfway up the Cord Road, but you could pick up the Cedar River there. And then this is the Cedar, um, following along the Cedar up here, 
and that's going to be Cedar Rapids about up there. But that's the early highway. The early highway is, the, is essentially uh, the rivers. Now in this area, the for, supposedly the first settler of um, Lynn County is Abbey, who settles out uh, on near the creek uh, that bears his name. We really like to find the original Abbey property, but it's got to be close to uh, the Abbey Creek School, within probably a quarter of a mile along the creek. The second settler uh, was Daniel Seward Hahn, whose property uh, was um, over near the golf course at this point. Uh, and the, the argument about who's the first settler goes on in every county, I think, in Iowa. Uh, in this case, the argument uh, runs that um, Abby, see if I've got this right. Um, yeah, Abby comes from Ohio in 1836. Remember, Indians are still here in 32, 33. He's coming very close after that. Uh, and then he goes back home and picks up his family and comes out to stay in April of 37. Okay? He's here in, um, in March of, or uh, he's here in 36, comes back in 37. Daniel Seward Hahn, who rivaled with Abby all his life about who was the first settler, arrived in March of 1837, a month of Abby, and he stayed. He never left. So who's the first settler? If a settler is one who comes and stays, uh, obviously Daniel Seward Hahn is the winner. If the settler is the first one who comes and, and walks off his claim, then it's got to be uh, Abby. But we have uh, squatters coming into this area, persons coming in ahead of the actual survey. Uh, the federal survey that was to be done to lay out everything into acres so that it could be sold uh, by the government to the forthcoming settlers. The squatters come in ahead of that. And the people who come into Franklin Township in this particular area, uh, like much of eastern Iowa, are from the states of the old, what's called the Old Northwest. They're from Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, uh, some from Virginia, North Carolina, and New York. Uh, so these are third generation Americans. They know what they're doing. They know what kind of land they want to look for. They know how to farm. Uh, they have a very good sense of what it means to settle an area. Now, 1832, we've got Abby and, and uh, Han and by 1838. And in 1840, we have the military road uh, laid out. Now, military road starts in Iowa City right here, and it's going to go up to Dubuque. It's, it's marked here on this map. Now, the way this is marked is a man was hired by the name of Dylan Meyer uh, to, I'm, I'm sorry, um, not Dylan Meyer, <laughs> it's another generation. A man by the name of Dylan was hired uh, by the uh, federal government to, to plow a furrow from Iowa City to Dubuque. And that would then be a path that everyone could follow. So he takes his oxen and his plow and a compass and starts out trying to find uh, Dubuque from Iowa City. Uh, and uh, the, you'll notice some places along Highway 1 today, there are signs that say Dillon Furrow Road. Well, they're perfectly correct. Well, uh, much of Iowa Highway 1 today is the original furrow uh, plowed by Dillon. It has been changed some through the years, uh, but most of it is um, original furrow. And that includes the portion that comes across uh, Mount Vernon. And I, uh, I would love to write a little novel short story about what was in Mr. Dillon's head when he crossed the river at Ivanhoe and looked ahead of him, and why in the world did he decide to go over a hill? Uh, it makes no sense at all. Uh, there must have been some reasons. Well, as I looked at the early survey maps to, uh, you know, the, the area on the east edge of town here slopes down and there's a little creek and it's a little swampy down there. In fact, it's a little swampy all along the, the eastern side uh, as it goes uh, south towards uh, the cedar. But on the other side, on the west side, was a very large grove. 
Uh, probably, from what we can tell uh, from the surveyor's notes, it was probably a large oak grove, oak and walnut grove, on the west edge of town. So in some sense, was he going to go through the swamp, or was he going to go through the grove? If that's his dilemma, then it makes sense that he went up over the hill, which was all grass. Easy to plow, and he probably looked at it and thought, that's not much of a hill, I can, we can handle that, and over the hill he goes. Uh, and then on uh, to Anamosa, what becomes Anamosa, crosses the Wapsi Pinnacle there, and then on up to uh, Dubuque. But uh, what is left today of our early heritage is um, Highway 1, the military road. It was designed as a road that would permit troops to, to come overland uh, to Iowa City to protect the, the, new territory, the new state capital. Remember, there are still a lot of Indians to the north um, and, and to the west, particularly, and the north here in Iowa. They haven't all moved out in 1840. It's going to be uh, 1846 before the last large group is moved. Uh, and then even in the west, it's going to be at the 1850s before the Sioux finally leave the northwest uh, corner of Iowa. There's still some concern about the possibility of Indian resistance. The troops are stationed in Fort Snelling. They're going to come down the river to Dubuque. Then they could take the large bend and go clear out and around and come back and get into Iowa City this way. But pioneers knew that this, uh, this was a nice, in a sense, uh, lots of hills, uh, but if you went around the groves, uh, it was a pretty easy run. And it was much faster than trying to go through three sets of rapids that were on the Mississippi River. You had to get out of the boats, uh, walk considerable distance, get back in another boat, and keep going on. So this was a solution to the problem, was the military road. So it was, a, it was a, in some sense, a national defense effort. Uh, and in the 1950s, under the name of national defense, we will establish the interstate system. Uh, all I can say is we're one of the first national defense projects in our nation's history. Um, so we have um, the Highway 1 as one of the early uh, lines of, uh, here of communication. And Dubuque, of course, is settled early, very early, much earlier than most of the Mississippi because Julian Dubuque's up there. He's got uh, some mines. He's making lead, which is a very important product for shot for the frontier. And, and he has his land claim from Spain. So he's a very early person in the area, uh, but there's a community of folks there. Now they're going to be in Iowa, and their capital is going to be down here in Iowa, in, in Iowa City. So the major traffic in the state of Iowa in these early years is north-south traffic. So along Highway 1, people come down to the state capital uh, from Dubuque, and uh, there's a good traffic to Dubuque, uh, and then across the river at Dubuque into the Wisconsin Territory, much as there is today. So stage lines ran through here very regularly. This, there's no question about Highway 1 being a stagecoach line. In fact, this map that I have here from 1851 has an ad for a stagecoach company uh, on it. So we, we clearly have, uh, we are on the major artery here. And once the highway goes over the hill, I think the main lines, the early main lines of the town are fixed. Uh, it's very simple in anybody's um, mind to, uh, to know that if you pull a horse and wagon up a hill, either way, it's a nice place to stop and water your horse or give your horse a rest. And therefore, the town starts at the top of the hill as horses and oxen, uh, after the hard pull up the hill, have a chance to water and rest. Uh, so the town really has its focus on the crest of the hill. If the hill weren't here, there's no reason in the world for the town to be here. Uh, and especially as a merchant community. These early settlers, by the way, took uh, land that was um, where they had water and uh, good wood. They needed good water, and they knew they, uh, they chopped down the trees for their barns and, and homes. The log cabin period doesn't last very long in this part of Iowa, uh, but the early settlers clearly had available excellent wood for uh, homes and barns, and they had these uh, lovely streams that uh, provided enough water for them. The early squatters' uh, tradition was to stake out a claim. Uh, you walked 15 paces, 100, excuse me, 1,500 paces in one direction, and then you squared it off. It was simply, and that's where you drove the stakes. When you talk about staking a claim, that's how you did it. 
1,500 paces in each direction. Uh, that, that was your claim. That was supposed to be about 20 acres. So it was a very simple process. Of course, this gets very complicated when they, they finally get the maps made and you have to go to the land sale and figure out where your 1,500 pace property is uh, and try to get a deed and describe it. But that's, that's all um, another story. Iowa becomes a state in 18, I mean a territory it, by itself in 1838, just as Abby and um, <coughs> Han come into the area. Um, Abby was from Ohio and Han was from Virginia. And by 1838, the, the Mount Vernon Centennial book says that there was a population of about 50 people around the hill. And that would seem um, feasible that uh, you've got a small group of merchants gathering around the hill and then you take Abby and his family and uh, Han and family and a few other families around the hill and it's probably uh, by 1838-50 would be a reasonable estimate. But that's before the military road. The military road is going to come through in, in the early 40s, 1840 and years following. 1840, uh, we have the arrival of Reuben Ash. Uh, and about the same time, uh, 18, uh, by 1850, we have um, uh, Jesse Holman. Uh, I want to show some pictures now, just a second. Oh, I don't have a clicker, so excuse me. Do I? Yes, I do. Excuse me. All right. Um, you're all familiar with this piece of property. Uh, right here, uh, almost across the street from the back of City Hall. This was the home of Jesse uh, Holman, whose daughter, Ada Sherwood, is responsible for writing many of the early uh, pioneer recollections of her father uh, and his, uh, his contemporaries. Um, small uh, house, the back porches have obviously been um, or at least the second floor back porch has been uh, enclosed in and added with an exterior staircase, but the original house essentially is a rectangular shape, three windows and three openings on each floor on the front, and probably one uh, in the back. Very small, very modest home, probably still has the original metal roof on it. It's made out of local brick, and uh, we'll talk about um, local brick and its uh, influence on styles um, and the community in, uh, in a moment. But here we have the Reuben Ash estate. This one is um, uh, in the hands of June Harrison. Um, this building is probably from about 1855. We know that there's an addition on it that's hung on that goes over this way. I'm not showing you. Uh, that's 18, uh, probably between 1860 and 1865. Um, here again, we have three openings um, across the, the, the front and the second floor. One of the, of course, one of the openings is a, is a, um, a door. This is a very popular style. It's a simple rectangle, and you can either use the long side of the rectangle, as we saw in, in the Holman house, or you can put it on its end and uh, use the short side. This is going to be longer this way than it is across the front. Uh, the use of uh, native limestone uh, is uh, very prevalent in Mount Vernon, and for basements, or foundations as well as for um, window and door trim. This is a very uh, elegant house for the time, for 1850s. Part of that elegance simply is the limestone, that it's not only below the windows as a practical matter, but it's decorative uh, on top and below the window, undoubtedly with shutters and a little attic uh, window at the top. Uh, lovely uh, transom lights around each of the doors uh, to let light into those dark halls. Uh, this is, of course, a pre-electric uh, era. Uh, and the style here is generally called uh, Greek Revival. Uh, there's very little about this that's Greek other than a little en these little entry porches oftentimes have columns, uh, either half columns against the wall and then columns out in front. Uh, but essentially, that's about as close a style as we can get. Now, this is a very simple style, easy to construct, and it was in the heads of everybody who came from Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, etc. This is where how homes were built there. They just simply knew what a house was, they knew how practical this was, 
uh, and they just simply brought this style with them. Now we've got a lot of homes from this period before 1865 in uh, Mount Vernon or soft brick. Of course, this is one of the lovely homes in the area. Uh, this comes to us from this period. Uh, the Bauman home of the Morrissey Place out on, the, on Highway 1 that is on the military road at the edge of the town. It's a farmhouse. Uh, all of the, the land around this house was part of the original Bauman farm. It'll take the, the town a long time to spread out this far on the south side. Uh, but again, you notice uh, here we have um, transom uh, windows, the little windows around the front door, half pillars uh, against the, the, um, the walls, but nice little capitals on them. And this house is very elegant in that uh, above each of the windows, bricks are set on edge uh, as a trim piece uh, rather than limestone, but there is limestone sills below here. And this now is taking, taking that rectangular box and making it larger. We start out with Holman's got three windows and on the second floor and two windows and a door on the first. Now just spread that out. Just keep moving it out. And now we've got five over five with a central door, and that's going to have a central staircase going right up the middle of the house, and that window is going to be in a hallway on the second floor. Again, letting light into these dark halls. Simple style, soft brick, a very flexible style, both in inside and outside. Another one, the Giannini property over off uh, A Avenue uh, in North and South 2nd Street. Uh, here it is again. This is three over three, except it's in, it, it, but here we have a deeper part of this rectangular box with two windows. Of course, the additions in the back. Uh, but the, here again, this, the, the window, the door is on the side rather than in the middle uh, when the, the house is used on its short side. This house is almost square. Another feature that gives these, that, that's very simple to do, uh, it's not much you can do on this with this style. It's very plain. Look, there's nothing over the windows. Not really. There's, well, there's a little bit of trim over the windows here, but not much. Not nearly as much as the, uh, uh, the Bauman or Morrissey home. But this roof line, there's a little check here on both sides. Now, your eye plays a trick on you because it will fill in the difference here. If you have a, an end of the house with uh, all three of these um, raised, on the overhang, it's called a full pediment. That is a pediment feature. This is called a broken pediment. Um, Old Sim, built about the same time, and the college has a full pediment. College Hall, within the same years, also the ends of the building, because they're large, often have a full pediment. Um, soft brick, as I say, uh, just almost nothing to give this home any particular charm. Although when we get to Old Sem and some of the larger buildings, we're going to see a little brick trim right here on what's called a frieze or immediately uh, under the overhang of, uh, of the roof. Here's another early brick. Um, this is the Ebersol, known as the Ebersol home, virtually across the street. I'm only showing you this part of it because the other part has a large addition on it. This house has a, a very interesting and fascinating history. But it's in, a, it's in the original town. And we'll talk about the original town in a few minutes. But here you have a very lovely uh, treatment of brick over the windows, like the Bauman house, limestone sills, uh, original shutters, they're walnut, uh, a kind of broken pediment here, just a little check coming back. Uh, this is three over three in the front. Three over th uh, three here, the door and two windows, um, but the door is in the center here. All kinds of variations on this. The original house probably was came through about here, and this house is um, deeper than it is wide, and that would be the the, the style. Of, we it took me a long time to figure this one out because this house looks like all this brick is original. You don't see any change in the brick here between the original house and the back. Uh, and the addition to this house on the east looks original as well. The brick just doesn't seem to have any breaks in it at all. And it is all soft brick, which means it's all baked uh, on the property. Well, I'll deal with that in a minute. 
But what this house had all around it was a huge brick fence. And I'm convinced that when they made the addition, they took all the brick from the fence and used it in the back, and they used it on the east side, and then they added this kind of, of lovely little flourish back here um, from the brick uh, that was uh, from the early brick that was used in the back of the house as a huge, uh, large brick fence around the property. Uh, again, soft brick here. Here's another version of it again. We're seeing the same pattern, and through the 1850s, uh, door on the side, transom, uh, three over two. Uh, this one's in backwards, uh, but two windows back here because when you come into this house, the stairway goes right through here. It's hung on this wall. So you don't need a, you can't afford windows when you're trying to hang a stairway. It's going to weaken the walls. Uh, but then the two windows at the back, one will be uh, at the top of the stairs and the other will be a back bedroom. Uh, no pediment here. No check pediment. This is about the humblest version that we can get. They've painted here, uh, but that is not, um, that's not limestone. Um, and this one, of course, is on, uh, on Main Street. So we have the Reuben Ash. Um, we have um, Jesse Holman, a number of others coming. And in 1847, um, the town is plotted and we're going to have the original town. I just want to finish up this sequence before I go on. Here's another house. Um, this one uh, you will see, I'll come back to this one, has a cornerstone. Uh, First Presbyterian Church, 1850, thought this was 59, um, 1859. That cornerstone is right here. You'll walk past it a hundred times and never see it. This was built as a Presbyterian church. The Presbyterians got into a little struggle theologically, the old school and the new schools, and uh, they split, and one group came down here across the street from the campus and built this church, and the other one claimed the property, uh, or had the, a church right across the street from um, the high, kitty corner across the street from the high school. That was the first Presbyterian church, and the marks of that church are still there, by the way, in that building. Um, well, they decided they could patch up their differences before they ever used this as a church. But it's the same style, that's what I'm trying to get, this box style, rectangular box style, old sim, old college hall, old Presbyterian church, all of these homes, everything is built in this style before the 1860s, uh, 70s. Uh, here you have, um, excuse me, got my, can't get my technology together. See the column, uh, the, the, this is a, a raised brick column that has a, that's the Greek influence. We'll see, we'd see that on Old Sem, or particularly, no, on College Hall as well. Uh, this has no broken pediment, just the, the overhang pediments. Um, and um, uh, the very other, virtually no other uh, features or ways to ordain, uh, or, or not ordain a building, no, to, um, to decorate this building. So uh, and here we've got, a, but we've got a balance. We've got three over three here with a center um, arrangement. Uh, this is College Hall from the same period, 18, uh, 18, mid-1850s. Uh, here you see these columns, uh, raised brick columns. Uh, again, the transepts over the door, around the windows. Um, with uh, a full pediment. Now you see the full treatment of the pediment. Uh, and because this is such a large building, uh, and it's a school building, we have uh, the addition of a cupola, uh, which could have been a bell tower or simply decorative. I think this one was, was decorative. Now, I want to talk about this soft brick. Uh, all these homes uh, were built out of, um, that's my term, soft brick or Mount Vernon brick. That is, it's brick baked right on the property. One of the unusual features about this community is that there was a clay deposit about uh, three quarters of a mile south of town, and it was found very early. Now you have a huge bend in the Cedar River, and you've got lots of beautiful sand down there. We still have sand uh, pits along the river. So within two miles of town, you have clay and sand 
and you've got plenty of water. And in the 19th century, the ideal building material is brick. Because if you have a fire, you always got something left. And fire was the great enemy of the 19th century. So the ideal building material was brick, and you had all the makings for brick here in the community. So what happens is a, a few masons come into this area, and people, in some sense, make their own bricks. They build a small kiln. Uh, they bake that brick and then uh, build the house right, uh, right on the property. This was true of Old Sem. It was true of, uh, college, of, of college Hall. And it's true of many of these homes in the area. This is an abandoned farmhouse. It was being torn down about 10 years ago. Uh, and I went out to check to see it, and it is soft brick. It's, uh, and it's, it's a very different dimension than modern brick. Uh, and every seven, they build these buildings with double brick walls. You have the inside, an, an inside wall uh, and an outside wall. And every seven rows of brick, you tie the two together. Now you can tell these early brick buildings, all the ones I've shown you are uh, built this way. Every seven rows on the outside, you will see a row of headers. When a brick is laid long, it's called a stretcher. It is stretching. When the brick is turned on the butt end this way, you're going to see out here, or you'll see the end of the brick depending on how wide this cavity is, but you'll see just the short end of the brick, the header. And that'll be in this area, we, whoever, whoever the masons were used this same style every place. There are three or four different styles of laying brick design. This is called English country garden, uh, technically. But it's at every seven rows, you'll find the, a row of headers. You'll see them on um, Guild Hall across the street. You'll see them on almost every one of these buildings. Um, is the, um, the, the, they're made of soft brick, and they're double brick walls with an air cavity in the middle. It's always fun, uh, people, you know, they've, they've got uh, wooden homes and they start to try to put some new electric, uh, electrical work in them and suddenly they're having trouble trying to fish their wires. They may have a, a brick home, one of these old brick homes with double brick walls that's been covered over on the outside uh, with wood. We have log cabins in some houses in eastern Iowa that are inside, they're the living rooms inside a larger house. They just built a larger house around the old log cabin. So you try to put electrical wiring in those and pretty soon you're drilling into solid walnut. Uh, it's, it's, you never can tell in this period what you're going to find in some of these old homes. But this is the soft brick and it's the double brick wall with the headers and stretchers. Okay. Now this is going to be a whole nother period but before we do that one let's um, Give me some lights and let me talk about uh, the, the original town here. Thank you. Um, to me, the town plotting sort of ends this first period um, of our settlement. Now, the original town, here's um, Main Street, and here's Highway 1, and the original town is right here and the cross-section of um, Main Street and Highway 1, okay? So it's about two blocks, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a little better than two blocks um, west and a block east. And it's from the intersection one block north and two blocks south. So this is, as I say, it's, and this, <laughs> this was not laid out with the compass in the sense that it's not on true north-south. North is here. There isn't a street running this way. So they, they laid the town out on the basis of the topography, not on the compass. Later they're going to have to straighten this out and it gets to be a mess. But the town is laid out on the basis of a topography. This makes very good sense. That's the, that's the, you know, runs along the, the hill, and this has got to go up and over the hill at, it, at one of its shortest points. But the original town is in here, and it's laid out uh, into lots 
by some of the uh, early settlers, uh, and the village begins to take shape. So we have now not just simply settlements around the town, but we have people actually living on property that they can sell. They've got lots, they've got deeds. And pretty soon, not very, very long after 1847, uh, George Bowman comes into town, and the first addition to the town will be Bowman's first addition. Here's the original town. Here's Cornell. And George just takes this big chunk here at the end of Main Street, I mean, with Main Street here as one boundary, and he joins it to the college, breaks that into lots, which can be sold. And we're going to start seeing how the town is going to grow first south and later north. We'll have to talk about that. But Bowman's first edition is going to be right in here, joining the original town with the college. 1851, we have uh, a number of interesting people coming. Uh, the cemetery uh, begins uh, out on the, where it is now, by, it begun by the Methodists. They'll later sell it to the, uh, to the city. And at the junction of Main Street and Highway 1, we have uh, re recordings that on the southwest corner of the intersection uh, where the Traver building is, uh, was a hotel. And across the street, not clear what that means, uh, was property owned by another one of the early merchants, E.D. Wall, W-A-L-N, very important founder of the town. Um, and he, he put up a two-story structure the uh, opposite uh, the, uh, the Traver building. 1853, uh, the college, uh, and uh, by 1853, there's at least one prominent wagon um, manufacturer in town, George Camp. Um, Bowman's first edition is 53, and about the same time, Bowman will build Guile Hall, which will be a hotel the old Giles Hall across the street. We'll see it in a little while because I want to talk about it in terms of how it changes. Uh, but the town has a first-class hotel by 1853. Uh, it has uh, the Methodist Church and the Presbyterian churches. It's got a school. Uh, it's, it, it's organized into lots so you can buy property uh, and they're uh, doing a good business. Um, the um, Morrissey home, the Bauman home, comes to us from 1853, uh, as I say, as part of a farm complex. 1855, um, uh, 53 is Old Sam, followed a couple years later by College Hall on the campus side. Um, and in the 1850s, uh, by 57, uh, the president of the college has bought a, a piece of property and a small brick home uh, on uh, what today is the property of um, um, <laughs> Dillard, Den Denver Dillard. Uh, that house, that house was torn down and that property was all developed at once. But this is the property. It's over here. The, the house foundation would have been between the house and the alley on the, um, on the west side. So the president of the college is, uh, is living there. Um, the next major break here, which will change our period the way we look at our history, is going to be the coming of the railroad in 1858. Uh, and the railroad comes through here, and by 1860, it gets to Council Bluffs. Now, it is also true that there is no bridge across the Mississippi River at this point. So you have a railroad that is primarily serving uh, the state. Now it has not crossed the Missouri. Now both those crossings will be made shortly after the Civil War and they're going to be part of the development of the building of the Great Transcontinental Ra Railroad which is by is going to drive the Golden Spake in Provost Utah in 18, what, 69? Uh, I think uh, an absolutely amazing uh, feat of, of engineering. I think it's either 67 or 69. I should know that, but it's close. Uh, I even give my credit, my students credits for that if they know which comes first. <laughs> um, in any case, um, the railroad is going to really change the, 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 the town in lots of ways. Uh, just for a point of reference now, 
1860, the population of the town by census is 790. Okay? We started with 50. We're now up to 790. That's a boom. In this era, that's a boom. Uh, when you add 700, uh, roughly 700 people uh, to a community, uh, that's a lot of people. Now, granted, there are a lot of people coming through here, but going west, the 49ers, all kinds of people have come through. But uh, that's a sub substantial population increase. Uh, and not much is going to happen between 1860 and 1865 because of the Civil War, although in the history of the town, uh, the Civil War uh, marks this town as it does every Iowa town. In the initial call for volunteers, 35 men from Iowa uh, signed up for the first regiment from, uh, from Iowa, from Lynn County. And there'll be continual uh, persons from this community going to the Civil War. So the Centennial book, which if you don't have it, is for sale over there. There's some wonderful stuff on on Mount Vernon in the Civil War. There's a whole chapter on it. It's very significant in terms of how it marked this community and, and how its veterans who returned really assumed tremendous leadership uh, for the future development uh, of the town. Well, with the coming of the railroads, particularly after 1870, uh, late 1860s, we have open communications to Chicago, which is becoming, with the railroads, going to become the great uh, grain and meat hub uh, and commerce hub of the, uh, of the Midwest. Uh, and we're going to get Chicago papers, we're going to get students from Chicago, the college, and pretty soon the north-south lines are going to make the college of, of accessible to a larger area of students. Uh, and Cornell will start to develop a kind of farm for recruiting students uh, out of the upper Mississippi Valley. Uh, we are almost equal distance from Chicago and Omaha and St. Louis and Minneapolis. And the early uh, publications of the college around 1900 are going to publish timetables and show you just how easy it is to get from any one of these four metropolitan areas uh, into uh, Cedar Rapids and Mount Vernon. But one of the things that the, the railroad brings with it um, are easily ex at, at building materials, which are now easily accessible. And as we move into the 70s, Americans, the war is over, we're going to look for a new nation, we're looking for new styles. And all over the, the United States, we start to move into what will eventually be called sort of a Victorian era uh, in America, where houses will no longer have this very simple rectangular shape and be fairly simple. Now we've got people with a little more money, they've got access to catalogs, uh, home catalogs, uh, you, can, you can pick a house out and take it to your builder and your builder will build it. Uh, and you have a tremendous amount of millwork available to you. Uh, all kinds of trim pieces for inside and outside your house. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be um, an era in which we decorate the house on the outside almost as much as we do on the inside. This is quite a change from the austere straightforward, very little ornamentation uh, of the pre-Civil War period. But there's money here to do it. There's technology here in terms of making, being able to make all this material and make it cheaply. And in Iowa, and the, the, in this part of the Midwest, we have the, the, all along the river the development of these large millwork industries. Minnesota and Wisconsin, the upper parts of those states, will be logged off. And those, those logs will be floated down the Mississippi River, and they'll be pulled, some of them will be pulled off in uh, Davenport, I mean in uh, uh, Dubuque, which will have large manufacturing uh, of all this, uh, this Victorian uh, or delicate uh, woodwork and exteriors. There's another huge co company operates out of Clinton, the Disbro Company. They publish catalogs, uh, so you can look at all this wonderful stuff. You can decide what kind of spindles you want for your balusters or uh, what kind of a newel post you want at the bottom, as well as, as, as uh, you know, how to, to uh, plate uh, colored glass for your windows, the whole works. It's all available. Same will be true in Davenport and Muscatine. They will become great millwork centers for uh, working these large rafts of lumber that are coming down uh, the Mississippi. Well, in this part, in our town, we begin to see this change in style. I picked this house first because 
Uh, it's, it is one of the few early architect design homes in town. In 1876, Cornell started King Chapel. It hired an architect from Chicago by the name of Cass Chapman, who worked in uh, one of the new popular styles, which was Gothic Revival. Now we identify Gothic with these sharp point, excuse me, sharp pointed windows. This is a, a clear mark of a Gothic style. Um, this is not the large, open Roman arch. This has got a little peak to it. Um, and Chapman's uh, design for King Chapel is clearly uh, a Gothic revival design in lots of ways. Uh, now, while he was here, um, he was, the, the, uh, was hosted by the acting president, Boyd. William Fletcher King was on sort of medical leave, went off to Europe to rest and try to get himself together, um, and Boyd became acting president. So while he's here, Boyd asked him to design a house for him. So this is the house that Cass Chapman, a church architect, designed for the acting president Cornell. My own personal speculation is that Boyd didn't have the money to build this kind of a house, uh, but he figured he was going to be the next president, that, K that King was never going to come back. So he went for it and got this architect, and it took him a long time to finish the inside of this house. A long time. Uh, and I think it's because he overextended himself financially. But uh, here we have um, the, uh, the Boyd House, uh, or now owned by the Dillards. Uh, and it bears all the marks of this new style, this Gothic Revival style. While we have brackets here, we have two little brackets under the wings, under the eaves. But look at the slope of this roof, how it angles. Uh, a bay windows, double bays, first floor and second floor, large, uh, narrow windows, uh, rather than the simple rectangles. Um, limestone, banding this building at at least two different, uh, three different levels. Which, uh, this is now hard brick. This is brick that's being shipped in here from the, from the kilns that are much hotter, and the brick, brick gets much harder. Uh, from either, and there will soon be kilns in Cedar Rapids and in Mount Vernon, but I think this came from, uh, from, the, from the east. Um, this uh, delicate uh, porch in the front, and we've got this strange tower here, and a parapet. Now, the Dillards have found uh, the drawings for a steeple, literally a steeple that was to go on top of this parapet. And I think Ed's been working with them about how to solve the problem of this flat roof back here and what might be done. But this is clearly an architect bringing a, a European style into America, into the Midwest, and modifying it so people can, uh, can use it. Crazy little dormer roof here. There is a spiral cherry staircase in this tower. It's been, uh, this was an apartment house for many years. It's been sort of cut to pieces on the bottom but it's a gorgeous cherry spiral staircase up the center of this. So we begin to see the, uh, the, the dramatic changes here in style that are going to characterize uh, the 70s and 80s. By the way, in uh, 1875, the population of Mount Vernon had risen very little from 1860. It was now 779. Booms over in 1870. But by 1900, the town population will be 1,664. So we're going to have, a, the, the 60s are a period of rather flat population, in part because of the Civil War. And the, the state loses a lot of people in terms of deaths by, uh, by the war and disease in the war. Uh, but between 18, 1870, 779, and 1900, 16, six, uh, 1664 going to be a, a rather, it's a boom period for Mount Vernon. Clearly it is. And a lot of these houses are going to reflect the prosperity um, of that period. By the way, in the census for 18, um, 1875, uh, 12 blacks are listed as residents of the town. And it's probably one family. Maybe two. We know of one family for sure, the Ruff family, who was 
was here in that period. Okay, now, this is the Victorian sort of uh, flair. We've changed styles. Um, we're going to look at a whole bunch of these because it's boom time and it's style time, and everybody's going to get in the act. Here we have um, two, three types of building material now all mixed. We have the brick. Excuse me, I'm trying to get my things together here. We have brick, we have limestone, and then we have vast quantities of wood used as well. We have a very asymmetrical um, roof lines and arrangements, and we're going to see that over and over again. 1870s, Squire Collins, um, longtime member of the Board of Trustee and faculty member. Um, this is the Collin House up on the hilltop, it's still there. Uh, again, a different style. We have these use of these Palladian windows. That's one arched window surrounded on either side uh, by a smaller window. This gorgeous Palladian window, on the, uh, which it is on the second floor, and a little porch here, a sitting porch, and these are uh, literally window doors out to the sitting porch. This is all leaded glass, which begins to come in. Um, look at the elaborate chimneys uh, here in chimney work. Um, dentals all the way along here on the frieze. The, there's actually a capital on the, this is the decorative corner of the house um, as well. Large transoms uh, in the outdoor windows, covered, sort of covered porch here with Greek columns. Um, this is a large elaborate home uh, from the period even though it's rather, rather rectangular uh, in, in shape. It's uh, the, the ornamentation on the house is very extensive. <clears throat> now, we have builders in town, um, and there are numbers of them. There's a very talented brick mason in town. There's, uh, there's uh, Brackett and Keys, who built numerous houses. Uh, there, are, there are two or three other contractors that uh, know how to take a pattern book and build you what you want. Now, uh, this is one I really love. This, is, uh, this house has now been painted in lovely colors. It's uh, the former Rose House, and before that it was, um, oh, um, pardon? Yes, right. Yeah, it's right across from, from Berta's house there. Uh, this is a lovely home. Now, look at, look at that, what's happened here. Not only do we have this porch, which is really a very integral to the house, we have a limestone footing. Now, look at the siding. The siding down here is different than the siding up here, and the siding here is still different. This is a kind of a shingle, cut shingling in here, almost a try to broken pediment going on here. Then we have a, 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 a clapboard siding here of one variety and another here. Very characteristic of, of this era. Textures on the side, uh, on the outsides of house. We just saw brick and stone. Uh, in wood, and here we see variations uh, in wood with these uh, lovely columns um, and very asymmetrical uh, design of the house. Two large uh, gable ends here uh, to the property. Uh, now, why don't we see if I've done this right? These are almost identical houses, one on the north side and one on the south. Do so you remember the siding here, 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 here? Now, this one's got a little more invested. This beautiful oval window with the, the uh, keystones and the, uh, the uh, panes. Uh, here we've got uh, carpenter's lace along a frieze, but it's the same sort of broken pediment, same sweeping porch that's angled. It's not a right angle with a bay hidden behind it, um, and the use of, of leaded glass or these uh, particular panes on these windows. Here's a lovely little, just a small little bay that's going to be over a, um, a china cabinet or a kind of hutch in the dining room. But, uh, ways to let a little bit of light in there. Um, go back just a minute. We've got a window here instead of the decorative piece. Nothing along here. But there's that bay hidden behind this porch. 
uh, just as, uh, as I say, uh, and it's not right angle, the porch is not right angles. Whoops, let's go forward. Here's the same kind of thing. So there are people, that, that there's at least one case here where people are picking very close to the, the essentially the same floor plan, only they're, they're dealing with it a little bit differently. Uh, this sort of uh, cottage, uh, small house, uh, smaller house, this is the one we just saw. Um, this is uh, now David Lopesacks, the, the hills have had this, but look at the lovely barge board. This is going to be part of this period, these little delicate barge boards, there you see what they do. They throw shadows of sun, the sun shadows, onto the house. They decorate the house all day long, and they're in the gables over here as well. Uh, open porch, um, but, uh, you know, delicate um, of millwork available. Uh, nothing grandiose about this house, uh, very un uh, not very presupposing, uh, but lovely. And again, uh, this is anything but square. Uh, broken pediment, type, uh, hitting of broken pediments here. All these are part of this period of in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. We're working towards the turn of the century. Now here again, fish scale shingles, uh, we have this uh, little barge board uh, up here. Uh, fish scales, I say on this, this floor is all fish scales. Uh, then we have a, a uniform siding uh, down this one, but this gable is clearly uh, decorated. Uh, the hint of a bay window, actually no, uh, it's raised from the wall, but there's no window uh, glass in here as there would be on a, a full bay. But here we have sort of the Queen Anne windows, the little panes along the larger surrounded, a large pane surrounded by the smaller colored glass panes, uh, which is called a Queen Anne uh, style of window. Uh, clearly a little sitting porch a little and receiving porch, uh, just enough so that uh, there's a clear sense of entry to the house and a, a rather welcoming uh, environment that's part of this whole lifestyle of the period. Now, in this period, at the college, they put a third floor, or fourth floor, onto Old Sam. This is Old Sam. If you're wondering, gee, I've never seen that building on the Cornell campus. They put another floor on it with these very large windows, which would be used for art studios or anything else. And then these lovely uh, windows. And this is a man technically a mansard roof. We're going to come back to this feature because it's, it becomes rather popular in town. Uh, but here is Old Sam. Now the entry is down here in the middle. It was originally right here. When the building was three floors, uh, it's the third window in, and you can see how the, the uh, brick has been scarred here. That was the door. Now they've moved it down to first floor. Um, so we have uh, the beginning of a mansard uh, roof era next to the chapel. Dramatically changes the, the shape of the, of the campus. Now here's another mansard, 1870s. This comes to us from France. This notion of a roof that looks like the roof ought to be here, but then you have a, a, a slope back and then a flat roof on top of the building with dormers uh, set into this uh, almost uh, false third floor. Um, of course, this is the, the Morgan Funeral Home, built originally by uh, two doctors, a husband and wife. Um, doctors Hogel, Kate Mason Hogel, was a Cornell grad and uh, the senior partner of this group. And this house was built as a residence and a hospital. Doctors had their own clinics here, and they lived here. And this hole in the back, um, we're not quite seeing it right. Um, there's a big porch, which was a solarium, a solarium uh, for sunshine. But look at the narrow, nice narrow windows, brackets along the frieze here, uh, part of that style, um, as well as the mansard roof um, with uh, a rather interesting um, kind of combination between Roman and Gothic uh, arches. Um, double bay windows. A asymmetrical massing or plan for the house. Here we have um, brick trim above the windows. 
on several of the uh, first floor and then and the second as well. But mansard roof here, one at Old Sim. Oh, well, we'll deal with this one. Just let me go try one more. Oh, I got it. Must have left it out. Uh, 1885. This is Bowman Hall at Cornell College. Uh, today the porch is missing. Uh, but it, and this was, which was built as a sunroom or a solarium. Uh, now there's a huge addition on here that was built in the 40s as a uh, kitchen and dining room for, for students. But this is the original building. This building is also by the architect of King Chapel and the Boyd House. This is Cass Chapman. The little pinched and uh, tower here uh, with the um, beautiful little iron, wrought iron work is still there. But look at the, the um, pointed arches here. This is still a kind of Gothic, modified Gothic style. Uh, lots of trim along the, in brickwork here. This is clearly a tower as in the Victorian Queen Anne style. Uh, that is a clear kind of tower. It's set off from the building. Uh, and of course, um, we have this may, may, a, a massive array of chimneys. And I thought all these rooms had stoves in them. But no, in the opening advertisement for this building, it says central heat. So well, these got to be purely decorative chimneys. Now they have been cut off about here. All this fluting, which gives them real character, has been, um, has been eliminated. But the pressed tin um, decorative piece at the top of the roof is still there, uh, as are all the uh, pressed tin work uh, that are along these, um, these high gables and dormers. Um, but this is the, the handiwork of, uh, also of Cass Chapman. And this porch mark, would mark this as in, in part as a style of what we would call East Lake, a kind of vari a variation of Victorian styles very delicate um, little porch. We have received uh, money from an alum to rebuild that porch in its original. And we do have all the pictures, so we, we can do it. Um, but this building is a classic example of how people thought women should be educated. This was a women's residence, and it was, it was an overgrown house. You come in here in these, these lovely big sitting rooms where you entertain gentlemen. Then there's sort of private rooms where women could be without men. There's house mother's apartment, uh, all kinds of things here uh, that are sort of, and the porch itself, uh, sitting on the porch. This is where you had tea in the, in, and you wore your white gloves and you learned the tea rituals in, in these lovely uh, living rooms uh, that were really the, uh, the parlors, as they were called, of this building. Uh, this is um, how one is not only educated to learn about Latin and other things, but one learns sort of the, what I would say the, the rules of domesticity for women. How you go calling, how you do tea, how you do these kinds of things. The building works for that uh, very, very well. Now this is Cornell in the uh, 1870s, just to get a point of reference. Old Sem, the first building, here it is back in its original form. Then we went to College Hall over here. Then uh, South Hall uh, on this side. Then they went back over here and did King Chapel. I'm sorry, this is, the, this is in 1887. And then the new building, um, Bowman Hall, in 1885. This drawing is from, uh, from 87. Uh, I've often wondered about this. This, uh, this is a wonderful etching, and the people were hired, you'd, you'd be able to hire people to do things like this. They'd come through your town and, and draw your house. Then they'd publish them in these sort of early editions of who's who. This is the Andreas Atlas of Iowa, where all the whole congressional district is in there. People are virtually advertising by showing you their factory or their house or their farms. We've always got cattle and stuff around. See all the people down here, you know, walking up around uh, the, uh, the fence, the whole works. You know, what kind of a perspective would you have to have on that campus to get that view. I asked myself several times and I thought, these guys were on the top of the water tower. <laughs> but the water tower wasn't there. They knew how to get, how, they knew how to draw perspective is my point. But if you, if you were gonna try to photograph this, you'd have to be on top of the water tower and this is not a campaign you photograph for you who have been around long, a long time. 
All right, so that's, the, that's what's going on in the west end of town uh, while the, the rest of the town is developing. Now here's the little cottage version, again. Uh, a lovely little home. In fact, this is National Register property in part because of, um, of its style and uh, the way it's, it's put together. Uh, this is, a, 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 again, for a small family. We're not talking about the big Victorians we just saw in the Dillard home, and we'll see more of. Uh, but this is the sort of cottage variety, uh, probably a college professor, uh, the humble folk in town. Um, but look at the lovely uh, work here in this short little gable. There's, you know, that's not much space to work in, and it's, uh, it's really lovely. It's been painted so we can finally see it. Um, one of the wonderful things about this, but you know, lovely little porch, uh, sitting porch and welcoming porch. Nothing really great here, uh, but it does show us how, in some sense, even this this movement away from the rectangular home and a movement towards uh, uh, decoration of the exterior of the house is very present here, even in these humblest homes in Mount Vernon. Well, we're in backwards uh, now. One of the popular styles in eastern Iowa is the Queen Anne. And basically the easiest way I can describe this to you is, that, is to say Queen Anne's usually have a turret of some kind. Um, you have to sometimes look to find it, but as I say, we just saw it on, uh, on Bowman Hall, the women's dormitory. You have to look a little bit to get it, but here you don't. There it is. Sometimes they're round, sometimes they're rectangular. Um, this is, again, two um, gables uh, sticking out at you with a tower set in the middle, but the tower doesn't exceed the roof, the, the top of the roof here. And look at the amazing amount of wood used in the outside of this house to decorate it. We have these huge barge boards that are very elaborate and require a tremendous amount of, of wood. Then just look at the uh, wood here incorporating this little attic window into this larger double window here. And of course, the same thing is over here. And you've got little uh, trim underneath the uh, window, and then these large, uh, these lovely bays with, um, here's a, uh, a pillar sort of carved into the corner. Look at all the teeth, the dentals here, all the way across, plus these delicate um, columns that uh, look like they're almost sitting on a, uh, the top of a of, of a pin or a spindle, um, and then these here. There's these these again these little dentals, darts underneath here, and even when you go past the house, look at this. Even the shingles along the the along this edge of the turret are cut into uh, uh, to V pieces. Um, it's, it's just amazing amount of decorative uh, elements here. Look at the, uh, uh, above the above the windows here and along the sides. Same thing is true of the door uh, down here on the first floor. Uh, this is the Wade House. Um, Professor uh, Wade at, at Cornell across the street from the chapel. Now turned into Victorian colors. A uh, little more um, interesting, uh, but really a, a very good illustration of this Queen Anne with turret uh, and I want to show you some more of them in town. For a while I thought, gee, this is an amazing small town. If you want to see a town with turrets, go to Tipton. Man, you can't go three houses without seeing somebody who's got a turret. And I came, I said to Mount Vernon, gee, we don't have very many turrets, you know. Then I started to look, and pretty soon you see them. They're, they're not sitting out there in the front and Main Street. But let's look at a few more. Is that Berta's house? No, that's the one, that's, yeah, that's next to you, isn't it? Right. Uh, here we got a, you know, very clear turret here, only this one's, uh, of course, with the, the peaked uh, top and it's, uh, it's uh, four-sided. Double bay windows. Look at, we got uh, shingling, I mean, one, one style of clapboard here and another on the second floor. Um, again, this use of textures, a dormer stuck into the roof with a, with a turret. Um, got more turrets. This one's on um, the Stein House. A uh, lovely sort of turret. Uh, again, um, I'm not going to show you the whole house, but look at the juxtaposition of forms, geometric forms and, and stuff here. Here you've got, uh, you know, a curve. You've got a fan uh, here, the dentals. 
um, these are rectangular lines. Then these are a totally different uh, type of fish scale. Um, I mean, there's, there's fish scaling here, um, your siding, and then of course the turret itself, uh, which dominates um, the front uh, front of the house. So got all kinds of sharp angles and lines. Yet um, we have these semi circles uh, or curves, um, and then these little corner decorative pieces as well. Tremendous number of um, lines, visual lines in these houses. Uh, here again, you know, look a little bit. That, that's uh, a Victorian turret. Just doesn't have any top on it. But it's a spiral, it's a staircase. And this is not a spiral, but it, it's going to have uh, several bends in it. And these are windows to let light into that um, staircase that's coming there. And this has some beautiful cut glass in it. This home was formerly owned by Dave Weddle. I don't know who's got it now. It's down on Fifth. Schroeder. Oh, Schroeder. Okay. Um, the bay window on this one over here as well. Um, and then these uh, lovely, uh, look at all the work they've gone to to put a dormer up here in the attic. Is it true that that house was Yes. Right, this house, we have a number of, of interesting stories, but this one came from uh, uh, Murner. There were two, two houses down there, Murner and one at Olin, where we put Olin. And the college moved those. Two of them were moved to, to Root House and joined on to Root House as the south, the north house and the, and the west house. Those two came from, I think, um, one from Murner and one from Olin. And this one, I think, was, uh, was Murner. But there, there are three of them that all were moved uh, to different locations. Uh, this is um, the little um, swags here on the frieze out of uh, carpenter's lace, so to speak. Um, you know, it's very, uh, very much Victorian. Now, here's um, another part of the Victorian period um, in the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s. We've got fish scale here, a Palladian window, um, the uh, uh, treatment of a dormer up in here with a barge board actually in the, dar in the dormer. Tremendous sense of entry here with uh, elaboration. Uh, there's actually a turret on this house. It's over here on this side. You see part of, the, part of it down there. But the use of now of this large sweeping porch all the way across the front and down the side. Um, that in this part of uh, Iowa and in Mount Vernon comes in in the 90s and it spills over past the turn of the century. Uh, my house is 1900 and it has a porch across the front and down the side. And it's, that's not the last one. I mean, there, it, it's, a, it's a style that lasts quite a while. But this is uh, very elaborate, shows you the choices of millwork that one has to work with. And of course, this one's been screened in uh, as well. Um, but this is another one of those, uh, again, many designs, many features on these homes. Silver and Ash Park. Um, the, the veranda, the, the porch on this house is very commanding. But again, we have fish scales and um, a treatment of attic windows. Um, here's a porch above the porch, a little tiny porch, probably off a bedroom for just sitting in the evening by yourself off your bed bedroom, but a big, uh, obviously a big entertaining or sitting porch on the first floor. Um, and uh, talk about irregular roof lines. We got one roof here, you got another one in here and another one there, and this is all set in the context of even another roof line. The roof lines on these houses are very elaborate, uh, and they, they give the house, um, a, a, keep the house from having a sense of being too big uh, or too bulky. Uh, the booth house, uh, this is all fish scale of one side. This, this, this floor is different than this floor in its siding uh, with a huge turret. All we got is here is a huge turret that's two floors. And here we have covered the, the turret with this round porch. There's a company door uh, or family door here and over on the other side, at the same place, uh, side is going to be a, a um, See, the one on the left is the uh, company door. The one on the right, this one is the family door. Go into the house without messing up the living room. 
um, kids can come in and sort of go to the kitchen or up to their rooms without having to go through the company. Um, or where you've got everything all cleaned and set out, so if somebody comes in, all you got to do if they knock at the door and you're not expecting them is run through and pull off all the sheets and it looks like you just finished cleaning house. Uh, but people didn't do spontaneous calling in these days. There were calling hours and you left the calling card. Um, you made arrangements to come by at three and see you and that meant you dressed for that, you brought your card, you were there at three, you did your business, you had tea, whatever, and you left um, and every, you know, people were expecting you, and the, the children were told, use the other part, the other part of the house. Um, this is a very unusual house. Look at the roof line here. We got a turret in front, then this back, and then even yet another slope on this side. This is, the, of course, the booth house. Um, here's another turret. This one, of course, is uh, Platner House up on the campus. Uh, this is round. The glass in the windows here is round. Um, actually uh, molded that way, but then it's square up here. It's round on the first floor and then uh, rectangular square up in this area um, with uh, nice Roman arches here, uh, right angles here, um, porch above the porch, a kind of a family porch area here off of this huge hall, um, a, a pressed tin roof with uh, the roof uh, ridge decorative tin, all pressed in tin. Here we've got fish scales. Uh, we have a shingling on this side that's plain shingling without the fish scales and then sided here. Uh, look at the lovely terracotta work in the chimney here as well as the banding of limestone uh, throughout the, the building. Um, this is a, a very interesting home, but it, as I say, it's turret. You, you, uh, you just have to, just, you, when you look at it, you begin to see it. Now, uh, this building defies style. Um, there are all kinds of wonderful stories about it. This was, uh, was um, Gormley, a Gormley home. Uh, not Walter's, Walter's grandfather, I think. But, uh, the, you know, the story in town was for years that um, he was a dentist, and every year he'd go to Chicago to the dental convention. That was the one trip he would make. And while he was gone, she would hire a contractor and, and put something else on the house. Uh, makes a good story, but that was the, that was the story. Now, um, and here's the prominence of this porch on the second floor, but look at the entry, uh, lovely entry here, uh, which is part of the Victorian porch all the way along the side here with another entry back here into the kitchen. Uh, crazy roof line, but in some sense this area has got to be seen as a, as a kind of, of turret. It is, in, in, at least in, in its feature, in its design feature. Look at the lovely little panes in the windows up here in this dormer, uh, as well as the, the woodwork on that side. Um, and the, the way the uh, break between the first floor and the second floor is a kind of, of uh, swooping uh, of the and pulling out of the wall line so that this is actually this this wall while it's under that one uh, is tucked under uh, this uh, this feature you see it here you see it here all the way through the, the the house this is the Gormley house now the bed and breakfast now before I get into the um, what's coming after 1900. Let me see if I can get us to where we are here. Um, the, um, we're talking about this period between 1870 and um, 1900, where we're saying the population is going to be up to, to 1664. In 1900, the town had electricity for a few hours a day. It had telephone service probably no more than five phones, but it was here, and it had a central water and sewer system. So the town by 1900 is, has got what it needs in some sense to continue to enter in, uh, the, the modern period. Uh, it has a tremendous number of uh, these lovely Victorian homes, and I want to say why, or one of the reasons why. I've mentioned that people simply got tired of rectangles, 
and it was a popular thing to do. All kinds of magazines were telling you, build these lovely Victorian homes. You got wood, the whole works. But probably in Mount Vernon, um, there is a, a, a unique feature. And that is from 1885 to 1934, the college did not build any residence for students. And in fact, in 1885, there were no residents for men. There had not been a residence for men on the campus since the Cornell Boarding Association, which was South Hall, uh, proved to be um, uneconomical in 1880. So in some sense, where are all these students living? They're living with people in town. And it was a, it was a wonderful business. You build this big house, you got a lot of kids. The minute your kids leave, you got rooms to rent to students. And it is amazing the number of homes I have found in this town where students lived. Now, these are not, we had a couple big boarding houses and rooming houses that have been torn down. Uh, but essentially, you look at the yearbooks and you have pictures of two or three women standing in front of this house, or two or three guys standing in front of the house, or, you know, but these, this was local parentis out the years. These people signed on to be your parents and they were. They made sure you were in, that you studied, that they knew where you were all the time, uh, and they got a, a good return on their investment. But you have this bonding between many citizens in town and students and students' families. You know, if you're going to Cornell, you have to live with Mrs. X because that's where our son lived, you know. Our second son has got to live with Mrs. X because she's already part of the family. Uh, you have a tremendous it's set of interesting social relationships that develop because of this policy. The first men's dormitory at Cornell will be built, uh, will be Murner Hall in the, the late 1930s. Now, think about this in terms of other campuses, other colleges. This is a unique feature of the college and it, it is one of those interesting things where it shows this interdependence of the college and the town. That college was able to grow in students without huge capital investments for residence halls because it had a cooperative and willing citizenry that, would, that made the investments in these big homes and were willing to take in students. We have a, a wonderful story in uh, some letters of um, a woman who, whose husband was killed in the Civil War and she apparently lived someplace down in the Ivanhoe area. Uh, and she hung on to the farm for a while. Uh, she was running the farm while her husband was in, uh, in the military and he died right at the end of the war or came home and died, but anyway, um, she finally decided to sell the farm uh, and to come to town, and she does, and she builds a home here in town and immediately starts taking in students. Good, good adventure, uh, good business. Uh, she's got a guaranteed annual income and a place for her, for her children to live, and she doesn't have the problems of trying to figure out who she's gonna get to do the plowing. Would have been, I, I thought would have been a, an excellent move for someone to make. Use that money, get the capital, you've got an income, you can pay the mortgage, and you got to, you know, you can send your kids to college at the same time. So that's the pattern all the way through here from 18, from as I say, actually from very early on, Cornell did not provide residence for students. Old Sim initially had students living in it, so did College Hall. But we're talking about a college of 120 people at the most. Uh, so as the college starts to expand, it looks to the community as a source for housing. And I think that is really one of the, uh, one of the most interesting marks of this town. Uh, and we continue to find uh, and to document where students lived, and it, it's pretty extensive. It's very extensive. I'm in the Istone house. Uh, Istones clearly had students living there. Um, they even, in one of the, the uh, old Captain Istone wrote his memoirs, starts talking about all of his good friends who were Cornell students and starts listing them, and I'm sure they all lived with him. Uh, I mean, I think that's how he, he really knew most of them, was that he rented a room to him. Well, which is a block and a half from the campus, an ideal place to, to rent rooms. So by 1900, as I say, the, it, I'm, I'm trying to make a case here that early on, by the time the town is laid out, the village lines are fixed. And by um, 1900, um, the town is ready to enter, uh, in some sense, ready to enter a, a period of growth and the modern world. Um, so we move rather quickly then uh, between 1900 and 1920 
Um, we're still in the railroad era, so to speak, although railroads are beginning to, to play less of a role uh, in the national scene except in World War II. Uh, we have, uh, again, some changes in American notion about building styles, and we're going to see them right here in Mount Vernon. We are not exempt from, from any of these styles, and I'm, uh, most of the ones of major styles are going to come to Mount Vernon. This, of course, is a, is a combination of, of two elements. The bungalow style, uh, which again moves away from the Victorian, and stucco. Um, these homes, uh, stucco was supposed to be the ideal building material uh, because what would be better than having in the winter a solid cement house to keep out the cold? Uh, and what's going to be better than being able to keep out the heat? And you don't have to, you know, don't have to paint it very often. Um, you know, can sort of whitewash it pretty cheap. It's easy to put on. It's supposed to be the, the building material of the future. Didn't quite work that way, as you will note as you go by this house, the old West house. They're doing an awful lot of stucco work. But this sort of story and a half, or the appearance of a story and a half bungalow with the large front porches, still retaining a lot of elements such as brackets back from the uh, earlier period, uh, but all kinds of different window arrangements now. Here's a hint of a bay window, um, but there's something clearly different going on here, uh, as well as in these dormers, uh, and we're going to see more of this. But the bungalow style begins to really dominate um, the middle class housing market. Here's the front of this house, uh, again, the dormer sort of on second floor that makes almost, a, it, it's going to have a second floor, but it just, it gives you the impression that it's only sort of a story and a half. Uh, these open arches, uh, again, irregular uh, placement of windows and doors uh, are part of this style. We'll see some more of these. Um, this is a, a classic bungalow. Mary, you lived in this house, didn't you, for a long time? Classic bungalow style. We'll see one, a, a second one here. But, um, you know, it's a two-story, but they're trying to give you the impression that it's really, um, it's, it's more cottage look, cottage feel. The, the colors here are nice for the, for the bungalow. Um, let's hit another one here. Yeah, this is a classic example. This is now Rob Sutherland's house. Charlie Cochran lived here for years. Uh, this is classic bungalow right out of the pattern book. I can show you exactly you know, who drew this house and how much it cost in terms of floor plans and the whole works. We have a whole issue of the uh, Old House Journal here on bungalows. But this is a, these are the, the one I was just saying that Mary lived in, and this one are just classic bungalows as well as the, uh, the stucco one. Here we've, we're seeing uh, a shingling surface on this rather than stucco. Uh, and the, uh, these large uh, treatments, of, of again, of brackets. Um, this is sometimes known as kind of a craftsman style, um, sort of small informal, part, uh, informal porch, very open, none of the elaborate treatments of the Victorians, and again, um, a, a, essentially a story and a half or a two-story house that's pulled way down to give it a cottage and a feel of warmth and welcome uh, and clearly a smaller family size. Uh, as family size decrease uh, after 1900, uh, we see more and more of this craftsman and bungalow cottage style stuff um, in the American landscape, and, and we see it here in Mount Vernon. Now here's an interesting com contrast and combination. After World War II, in the 1920s, uh, the bungalow dominates uh, a lot of building style between about 1910 and 1930s, or 20s. And then in the 30s, um, 20s, uh, in the 20s, I'll get it right, uh, Americans started looking at European styles and beginning to copy them. And we have a couple here that I want to show you that, are, that, that illustrate very clearly um, this sort of looking at other styles around the world and bringing them into the Midwest. Whether they fit or not, who cares? Uh, this is the Prawl House on the, on the corner of uh, Fifth and um, second uh, on the south side. Um, this is clearly a Mediterranean in feel and in tone and everything else. The heavy terracotta roof, the Jenkin head we call this design here. The roof doesn't see the difference. 
this is a whole hunk of roof hung on here. Um, a, this is a V-shaped um, uh, bay window, a little bit of stucco and timbering up here, which is almost a Tudor. Uh, no porch really here. Uh, this is going to grow vines and, or something on it. Uh, lots of these narrow windows that are almost French doors uh, throughout this house. Um, the, the, uh, as I say, there's, there's virtually no sort of Victorian or cottage style porch. Uh, and here we have um, a, uh, a dormer uh, on this long sloping roof. Now here, look back here, we've got more stucco and more timbering uh, that carries this element back here. And this is the garage. And I'm still looking for, to document, the first garage as part of a house in Mount Vernon. Now, this house was done by a Cedar Rapids architect. And I think that it is the first house in town that actually is built with a garage in the house. And it's on the back side, and it's on this long sloping back roof, the garage door you see right here. Uh, I think this is the first one that was intentionally designed that way. Now here's uh, the Welso house um, or the Shaw house or whatever. Classic Victorian in every sense. This is Queen Anne. This is a little, uh, there's a turret here virtually on this house. Uh, bay windows here on the front. A texture of uh, on one floor, brick on the other, and metal roof uh, on the third. Uh, second, uh, the small little uh, porches very irregular massing and, and arrangements of, of roof lines. Um, that's the 1880s. Um, this is the 1920s. And they make a nice contrast next to each other. In terms of the lines, the feels of the house are really quite different. Um, this is massive, has almost an austere character to it. A um, little bit of trim here over the, the windows with limestone sills. But, one of the interesting things about this house is this is all sun porch. And it's really included within the roof line of the house. You've got almost a pediment here, but it doesn't go any place. There's no balance. Look at this. There's no balance between these two sides. But this is all sun porch. Uh, and, but it's within the private space of the house. Very clearly wrapped right into the house itself. And that's part of the, uh, in a sense, of this uh, style with this, uh, this is very heavy modern uh, brick, uh, and it's dark. Um, this is this is all trimmed in metal, by the way. But that's uh, that's a European copy or uh, of styles. Here's the back of it with the uh, the timbering. Well, you can really see this now, kind of tutoring, and with the garage. Um, and here you see the the sun porch off. Of this whole thing is really sun porch here. Here's another one. This is the Duval house. Um, and it's English cottage style. It's right out of a, another uh, architect, or same architect, I think, as the other house. I'm not sure, but you know, it's, it's, it's a copy of a kind of English, the feel of an English cottage style home. Uh, this is, of course, limestone, lovely limestone. The doorway is recessed back into, from the outside wall. Um, the, the rough texture is, is left on the limestone, uh, not presupposing at all, um, but uh, wrought iron, uh, use of a little bit of wrought iron balconies on French windows. And then this house has a garage as well built into it. It's just a couple of years behind the Prawl house. Um, really a lovely, lovely home. Uh, and the inside is cottage style with, you know, sort of large uh, pine floors, uh, wide boards, uh, things like that. I think we'll have one more here. Yeah, this is the Van Etten home, and I put this in. This is about later. It's in the 30s, but um, and Geneva can check me on this one. Oh wait a minute, no, this is the. Am I in backwards? And I got the. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. This is the Miller home. This is the. Yeah, it's in back. It's backwards. You got to turn it around. This porch belongs over here. <laughs> Uh, no, I went to have the, the uh, we have in town uh, next to uh, the, um, the old former Van Etten home, uh, and it's English cottage style as well, but it has such a, a wonderful history of its own that um, uh, it it's just needs a, 
a lot of attention. Now we go to the 1930s uh, and, and uh, 40s, 50s. We're in the automobile era. The first transcontinental highway across the United States that will be marked uh, and paved is the Lincoln Highway US 30. And, and for many years, the original highway up until the mid-1950s, that highway was Main Street in Mount Vernon. We were literally on Main Street America, the major first road between New York and San Francisco. Uh, and that really put the town on the map. Everybody went through it in your old cars. What's left from the Lincoln Highway? Not a lot. We have a marker um, out uh, in front of uh, City Hall, thanks to um, Sarah. Uh, and we have a few things, but the, w one of the things that happens here is that as people travel by car, um, as in the old days, people opened their homes and said, okay, we've got places for, for tourists to stay overnight. And we have what we call the, the, the tourist home. Everybody just had, it was just, this was bed without breakfast in most places. Uh, they had a little sign out and it was uh, Tom Bodette will keep the light on for you. That's exactly what it was. You put your light on and a little sign out and in other words we've got a room to rent uh, if, if you're passing through. Well we know that several homes in town were used uh, as stops. That they did advertise for, uh, for tourists to stop and this is one it's across the street from the high school this was not built in this period. Uh, it's clearly from the turn of the century. Uh, all this texture is shingling, both floors. Look at the, uh, the sawtooth designs, the little um, dentals here, the, the porch. Uh, this is sort of an American four square house. It's just basically a square house with a gable in it, but it's got a porch across the front and down the side. Uh, but nothing uh, really elaborate here at all. This is sort of turn of the century house. Uh, it gets a little bit of character from the fact that instead of having siding, it's got this fish scaling. But here we got balanced windows, uh, as I say, totally rectangular uh, house, um, not terribly interesting um, porch, but no, okay. But this house is, is in part is significant because we know we have documentation that it was a tourist home. Um, and as people pass through. And it, I've got a, some citations in some material I've looked at to Mount Vernon wanting to build a, um, trying to find money to buy uh, and build a, um, a camping grounds. People camped out as they went in tents. And uh, Charlie Hedges and some other people were trying to raise money to have a Mount Vernon camping ground for tourists on the Lincoln Highway. Part of this phenomena is also the first uh, motels. Uh, they were cabin courts. Uh, and I kept thinking Mount Vernon must have had a cabin court someplace. Uh, and sure enough, uh, there was one just three mile, it was a mile exactly down the road on Mount Vernon Road, which is the old Lincoln Highway. Um, um, somebody gave me, who was it, in the bank. Um, I'm sorry, I can't say this name. Uh, her her in-laws ran a tourist court, and so and I have we have documented the pictures of all the cabins. Uh, you drove in and had your own little cabin. Uh, they weren't necessarily connected. They were all sort of in a in a nice little park area, but uh, Mount Vernon did have a a, a cabin court. Uh, so you had your choice: camp out, try a tourist home, or go to a cabin court or make it to the next town and go to one of the quote motor hotels such as in Cedar Rapids the Roosevelt which was built as a motor hotel in the 1920s so in the automobile era, era comes through we don't have a lot standing um, from it but we do have at least a couple documented homes that served as tourist cabins uh, tourist homes um, this is uh, ginger uh, Hansons before the paint job, and it's in backwards. I apologize for that. Um, this was also at, at one point known as a kind of a tea house. Um, right, Jenny? Didn't you have some evidence of uh, tea rooms? Right, and it, it's also um, had, we've got a picture with a little sign that says, you know, tourist rooms uh, in one of those photos someplace. But we, this is another documented one on that case. Uh, I would think almost any home on Highway 30 would have been a tourist home. 
Uh, most people weren't going to turn down a chance to uh, get a little money for some clean sheets um, for anybody coming through. Um, but uh, that's uh, the uh, other phenomenon. Okay, we got some lights here. Um, 1920, the population of Mount Vernon was 1,466. Anybody keeping track? That's down 200 from uh, 1905 or 1900. Um, the depression, um, the loss of uh, the value of uh, farmland in the 20s in Iowa, people start to leave in the 20s, long before the Dust Bowl. Uh, the population of Mount Vernon uh, will make its way by 1950, will make its way back up to where it was in 1920. So it's a, it's, a, it's a long period here. Now, the difference is, if you look at the census, you'll find I'm wrong. Uh, and it looks like there's a boom in town. But in the 1950 census, the Census Bureau started including students as part of the town rather than where they lived. So we have a 750 or 800 jump in population that is simply students. Um, and that's really uh, so I say my, my figures are that it took, it took us till 1950 to get back up to where we were in 1920, um, because, or, or 1905, because of the, of the changes in the, the economy. Um, just a few comments about what we're, uh, I'm thinking about in terms of the uh, period after 1950s of the 1950s. Uh, the bypass through Mount Vernon in the mid-1950s has made quite a difference to this town and will continue to do so and it will continue to be an issue. Um, we fight very hard to hang on to the downtown area uh, as the uh, business is sucked off or sucked down towards these, uh, uh, these highways. So uh, it, do it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to drive the original Lincoln Highway and then drive between here and I did this between here and Clinton and then come back on the new one, uh, Loudoun's virtually dead. Wheatland. I mean, you look at all these towns that started out as railroad towns, they became Lincoln Highway towns, and there's nothing. I mean, it's not simply because of the highway, it's very complex. But what business there is there has been sucked down to that highway. And that's, that's true all across Iowa. And it's, um, uh, it's our problem. Uh, in terms of what happens here to, to Highway 30 and how to hang on to uh, the business district. Um, but that uh, mid-50 development, it was, it, I think, was very significant. For me, the most significant historical development, of which there's very little any kind of photographic evidence, uh, one of the most significant uh, parts of our history in the modern period was, was the fact that in World War II, a tremendous demand for labor in Cedar Rapids and the housing shortage in Cedar Rapids really took Mount Vernon into the orbit of the Cedar Rapids metropolitan area. Up to that point, if you look in the newspapers and other kinds of things, there was a certain kind of independence here, economic independence, that changes with the war. Um, you know, I, I, it, to me, it would not be unusual if uh, half the people living, in, if more than half the people living in Mount Vernon didn't start to work in, in war industries in Cedar Rapids in World War II. And we all know now that our population, basically, uh, a large portion of it work in either Iowa City or, or Cedar Rapids. And they enjoy the quality of life in the small town. But this is, we're, we're no, lo no longer an econ as economically viable as we were in a previous generation. Our fate is tied to Cedar Rapids. And if you have any question about that, look at real estate values during the gas crunch in 74 to, to 78. Um, <laughs> we took it. People did, was gas, prices went up, gas was hard to get. We had the first, this first gas uh, uh, war or gas glut uh, and our real estate prices took a, took a dive. You know, we, if you have to, if you got off, you got to pay a lot of money for gas, you're going to live closer to Cedar Rapids than, than Mount Vernon. Uh, so watch the price of gas. It'll, it'll tell us what's happening to the real estate market. You heard it her first. Um, but uh, real War II really does, uh, I think, move us into the Cedar Rapids uh, economic orbit in a much different way. I think the evidence is very clear. Uh, there, there's no architectural evidence for this fact. Uh, but the town has, has also continued its slow growth pattern. Uh, now, and we've done a lot better at that than a lot of small towns in eastern Iowa. 
Uh, but we are, we have, as I say, look at the whole history of the town. It's, uh, uh, it's essentially a kind of slow growth um, development. And, uh, and I think in some ways uh, we've, we've learned how to deal with slow growth. And I'm a little frightened uh, to think of what we might do if we sort of got overwhelmed by um, somebody uh, buying one of the farms and putting up a sub subdivision of 5,000 people. Uh, although I must say, when I first when I first interviewed here at Cornell in 1967, as I was driving out with uh, my host from downtown Cedar Rapids along Mount Vernon Road, uh, he told me that uh, there was just a recent study that predicted that by uh, 1980 uh, we would be houses all the way from on Mount Vernon Road, from houses all the way to to uh, Cedar Rapids from Mount Vernon. Um, I'm glad it's not there, but the projected growth was on the east side, and it all turned out to go on the west side, or most of it. So, who knows? Uh, the other thing that I think is is uh, we need to, we will have to factor into our history and whether or not there's much architectural evidence for this. Um, I don't know. I will. I don't think there will be, but. Um, the college clearly and Cedar Rapids have clearly profited from uh, a, um, a rather extensive air service into this area. Cedar Rapids becoming a regional airport uh, has meant a great deal to business in Cedar Rapids. They've worked very hard at it uh, to, to make sure they have that. But from the college's point of view, as, as our market becomes a national market, uh, we are very dependent upon uh, good air service into the town. And I think that in a lot of ways, uh, the town is, um, with, with Cedar Rapids, uh, is, is going to have an interest in, in what happens in the, uh, the air, airline business. Uh, and that's part of our, I want to wrap it up with this, you know, if you want to talk about Mount Vernon history, you've got to talk about the history of transportation. That sooner or later, if you look at military road, you look at railroad era, you look at Lincoln Highway, you're looking at major art, uh, transportation developments in, developments in this country. Uh, and I'm just saying, I think sooner or later, in some kind of intangible way, we're also going to be linked uh, with uh, with the world by air and probably telecommunications. But uh, I doubt there's going to be many uh, artifacts left uh, uh, to uh, testify to those developments as, the, as there have been uh, with these great land developments. Um, the other thing I just want to say at the end here is that uh, a friend of mine talks about Iowa as the pass-through state. Um, you know, everybody passes through Iowa. 49ers, you know, the Mormons, I mean, everybody sort of passes through here. Uh, and, and Iowa is just sort of this green pass-through state. Um, and um, you know, on Interstate 80, I, I can understand that, that you sort of pass through Iowa. Like, I passed through Nebraska. I mean, <laughs> um, but I think the, that for those of us who have not passed through uh, and have decided that uh, this is a community uh, that we really want to invest ourselves in, I think we are, um, we, we must commit ourselves to at least some appreciation for uh, 150 years here of, of uh, artifacts that, uh, that have significant stories to tell. Um, I am not a purist. I, you know, I don't want uh, everybody to have uh, their house perfectly the way it was before, but um, this town has a very ama amazing uh, history, and I think it contributes uh, greatly to the quality of life in the community. Uh, so I sort of invite you to, um, to join us in that adventure. So thank you very much. I'll take some questions.